episode of Young SIC's webinar series. I'm Adriana Uson, SIC's Head of Americas, and I will be moderating today's episode with my co-moderator, Benson Lim. Both Benson and I are here in our capacity as Young SIC committee members, and to those of you who are not yet familiar, YSIC is a worldwide arbitration network that, among its many activities, provides a platform for young professionals and students to connect learn more about SIC and exchange ideas and knowledge about international arbitration. So if you're not yet a member, please do join us. It is a lot of fun and membership is for free, which is wonderful. So today, YSIC brings you another exciting session. We are very fortunate to be in a fishbowl discussion with Dr. Trina Baltag and Ms. Deborah Barker. Deborah is a partner at Withers Catterwong in Singapore and one of our senior counsel. Trina is a senior lecturer in international arbitration at Stockholm University. Hi and welcome, Trina and Deborah. So, in hello. hello, everybody. So, in keeping with the spirit of YSIC events, the format of this session is quite unique. Benson actually came up with this format. So, Benson, I give you the floor to explain the concept. Well, look, very good afternoon and good morning to everyone. I know we have an um, international audience. So it's good afternoon from Singapore, where I am right now. Um, this format is kind of interesting. It's a bit like a tech, um, the, um, Silicon Valley kind of format, where we call it a fishbowl. It's called a fishbowl because among the audience today, we have picked um, a couple of third panelists to be in with us, to join us on this panel. And um, they will be part of it. Now, they will take a short time, maybe about 10 minutes or so. Um, that's when um, we'll be, they'll be part of this discussion. But you should, as an audience member, participate in this discussion. That's a Q&A function at the bottom of the chat room. Please send in your questions. There will also be time at the end of the Zoom, this, um, at the end of this discussion, that we will invite more questions. But please do send them along as it progresses. And um, we'll be keen to get your voice heard out. Audrey. OK. Well, all right, Benson, I think it's time to dive into the fishbowl. So let's start with um, Krina. Krina, I just wanted to ask your, your sort of origin story. Uh, did you always know that you were going to practice arbitration or did it just sort of happen along the way? Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I, 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 I'm absolutely happy to be swimming with you in the fishbowl. Uh, and um, I do appreciate the question because I think some of us have experienced or most of us have experienced the same uh, uh, career path in a way. Um, I ended up in arbitration by accident, uh, but I'm very happy uh, for, for this. Um, I started as a transactional lawyer uh, almost 18 years ago. Uh, and I do believe that that was and had still has a major impact on my career uh, as an academic, as, a, as an arbitrator now. Um, I, I, I've experienced uh, from corporate uh, uh, um, uh, contracts for co corporate issues to, to uh, m and um, IP, everything that a trainee lawyer would have to have access to. So at the end of my training period, I, uh, I got involved into litigation and uh, domestic arbitration. Uh, and one day, bang, an investment arbitration came up, which was the Mikula against Romania case. Um, so that was a long time ago. And I was fortunate enough to start my career in international arbitration with an investment arbitration case. Um, I loved it. Um, and I decided to um, continue on this path. And the next move that I made was uh, I wanted to have solid background uh, for uh, a future career in arbitration. Um, I, at, that, at the same time, I was studying uh, economics. Uh, so I have a law and economics back, back, background. And I decided to continue with arbitration. And I went to Stockholm, Stockholm University, uh, for a master in international commercial arbitration law. Uh, that was uh, 16 years ago. And uh, I'm back at Stockholm, but this time to teach in the program and, and, a, and a senior lecturer in international arbitration. So um, I did manage to um, marry academia with uh, practice. And at this time, I'm, uh, I'm uh, practiced as, as an arbitrator. 
um, or, or um, I do some expert work in international arbitration cases and of course my position at the university uh, teaching and research in the field. Thank you. Thank you for that, Trina. Deborah, anything to add? I mean, you want to give a short, um, short story about how, how you end up as an um, arbitrator and arbitration practitioner? Well, actually, um, it, in a way, it, it is connected with the next question. But my next question is actually an answer similar to that that Krina has outlined. Because I never set out to be an arbitration practitioner. I didn't say I'm going to be doing arbitration henceforth. I was just a common or garden litigation lawyer. I started off doing both corporate and litigation work. And soon it, it went into litigation because really you can't in this modern world. And that was, that was some decades ago, so not even modern. You can't really combine these two different areas. So I was in litigation of all kinds, including commercial disputes. And then the first case came along where there was an arbitration clause in the agreement and I had to advise. And I'll tell you, when I first started off, I was a little nervous because I knew the rules of court very well. I knew the practice. I didn't know arbitration. But actually, I can assure everyone out there that it's not so very different. One, in one view of the matter, it's like litigation with tea and cakes and f frequent breaks, if you arrange for it, right? So I started doing litigation. And you could say that it was because of the popular, in fact, it's market forces that drove me to become an arbitration practitioner. I mean, I had a case where my client is a US company. The other party is an Indonesian company and they have agreed on, even though it was Texas law, governing law, they've agreed on arbitration in The Hague um, under the ICC rules. So that got me a chance to go to The Hague, okay? But in more recent years, actually, you could say it's the success of SIAC because apparently they were so successful in selling their clause that disputes that came up, even though the parties have nothing to do with Singapore, had, had SIAC clauses. For example, I did a case involving a Filipino bank and a um, multinational US-based software service provider and it's just that the contract provided for arbitration in Singapore and even for Singapore as the governing law and I did another dispute between a Malaysian bank and again a multinational this time based in Switzerland software company and again they had chosen SIAC and the governing law being Singapore so in a sense it's market forces that got me to try to dip my toe into arbitration, but it soon became um, something I'm very happy to do. As far as I'm concerned, a dispute resolution practitioner today has got to do litigation, arbitration, as well as mediation, three different forms, really the major, the three major forms of dispute resolution. So that's how I got into it. Yeah, I think that's exactly right because it is indeed that's because of the, the way that the, um, the world's disputes are becoming and obviously the great work that SIAC has done to sort of like broaden the beyond the shore. So, and this is actually the right time for me to bring in someone who is not in Singapore and London. And um, so I'm going to introduce uh, one of our third panelists, um, Mr. Alexander. Um, Alexander, you can come join us. Um, you're mute. Okay, hi, Mr. Where are you from? Just give us a couple of sentences. Where you're from? Tell us more about yourself. Hi, uh, hi, everyone. I am from New Delhi, India. I'm a law graduate and an advocate practicing in the Supreme Court of India and the Delhi High Court. So I started my journey to be an arbitrator was during the lockdown. So that gave me a lot of time. So because of which I started doing online courses on international arbitration by the Chartered Institute of arbitrators London. So by doing that, I understood the importance and the powers, the functioning and the ability of an arbitrator to understand the legal system in a different way. So that gave me an insight and that's how I started to do courses and explore more in the international arbitration arena. But just if I can uh, jump in, what, what made you uh, 
uh, being interested in arbitration? What, what, what was the interest specifically? Because as you said, you're a litigation uh, specialist. Um, so uh, in India, the Enrica Lexi case, the uh, Italian Marine case, that case was the the po turning point for me. So while I started to read upon that arbitration, I understood the importance and the different aspects of law that was used to uh, explore uh, other legal uh, systems to find uh, uh, eligible or uh, nice uh, remedies for other parties. So maybe I think that that's kind of interesting because I think um, like that Deborah and Alexander started from litigation. I mean, I also started from doing um, construction litigation to begin with. Um, and I feel just wanted to just since everyone's from so many different legal traditions and just maybe just throw out in the public. Do you think there is a, a that legal traditions are coming together? Do you see it's becoming uh, more common or do you think do you think that actually a lot of cases still have this national legal tradition? sort of flavor. I mean, Krina, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I had an interesting discussion about the seat or place of arbitration the other day with, uh, with uh, my colleagues from Brazil. Um, just by way of background, I spent seven years in Brazil, uh, most of them leading one of the um, uh, leading arbitration institutions in Brazil, uh, AmCham. And, uh, and the debate was, uh, how do you choose the seat of arbitration in international arbitration? And one, one of the panelists was advancing exactly this. There is uniformity. Who cares about the seat of arbitration? They're all the same. And my reaction was obviously, when it comes to rules, uh, to the arbitration rules, I think uh, uh, there is a tendency, obviously motivated by the UNCITRAL, the arbitration rules, arbitration law, model law, and so on. And, and Singapore, uh, obviously uh, uh, an example in this, but also one should not forget that uh, uh, each, uh, each uh, jurisdiction is uh, it's, uh, trying to compete for the best, for the top place by leading in innovation. And we have uh, Singapore, for example, at the forefront with the with the third party funding, with the emergency arbitrator. Uh, we have uh, institutions trying to uh, lead by innovation. And of course, when it comes to jurisdictions, it doesn't matter if uh, the, the arbitration rules and, and even the, the laws are similar, but the courts are different. Judges are different. There are jurisdictions where judges, they're not specialized. So I think um, it is important to give credit to each uh, jurisdiction. And, and uh, with Alexander here, and he, he referenced the Indian cases, I think we are all aware how, how rich our uh, research gets uh, on different topics, including the seat of arbitration, no venue versus seat, when, when you take a look at the Supreme Court uh, uh, of India's de decisions. Um, Karina, you, you raised an interesting point about, you know, like civil law and common law. And I just wanted to ask as an arbitrator, are you more comfortable uh, hearing a case, you know, before a common law or civil law governed um, case? I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm qualified, trained uh, in a civil law jurisdiction, but I practice in various jurisdictions and I spend a lot of time uh, and continue to spend some of my time in England. Uh, so uh, I, as an arbitrator, I have cases with English law applicable, uh, in general common law, civil law. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think I'm comfortable with both. Uh, I feel less comfortable when I go to my to to where I'm trained because uh, I have a duty of being an expert in my law. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do feel comfortable in both. Okay. Ebra, any thoughts? I, I I just w thought that um, the arbitration rules, the various arbitration rules are certainly similar and coming closer together, but the seat of arbitration, the courts that are going to consider any setting aside application, I think those are pretty different. And some are more arbitration friendly than others. We shall not name names. <laughs> but uh, so I think when you're choosing your seat of arbitration, you have gotta think carefully about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I suppose uh, we, if parties are international, neither wants to choose their own, neither side wants the other side's country to be the one. So they choose a third country and they have to think carefully when they do that. Is that an arbitration friendly 
country or would they prefer that it's not arbitration friendly so that we easier to challenge the award later but yeah yeah I think that's, that's now there's a greater awareness of this. I mean, you start to see that people are now being more aware. It's no longer such a binary kind of uh, fashion in which they choose a dispute resolution mechanism. Um, as a, before I let you go, I do want to ask you one more question. And that is, um, what do you, you know, just, just tell us what do you think you would like to achieve in, in arbitration? I mean, what do you hope to be doing in arbitration um, for your position? Just a quick chat on that. Um, I haven't thought that much in depth about how I will be going forward with the field of arbitration, but looking forward, I would be more uh, more into the different types of laws. So especially in the common law system and the civil law system, we see how arbitrators have to use different guidelines, rules, and application to understand the case and to implement it. Sometimes the most irrelevant document becomes the cornerstone of the whole arbitration itself. So. We have to, like, I myself would be looking forward to different aspects um, of how I would be able to deliver as a good arbitrator. And that's what I pray. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you, Alexander. Very much. Thank you for joining us today. So we're going to do a little bit of this vlog. Like I say, it's a fishbowl. Uh, but very much <laughs> thank you to you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And thank you all. So now next at um, to Vladislava. Vladislava is um, now from India. We moved to um, Bulgaria, if I'm not wrong. Vladislava, are you from Bulgaria right now? Yes. Okay, give us a quick um, short, short um, blurb about yourself. Tell us more about you. Uh, I'm a Bulgarian qualified lawyer specializing in international arbitration. Uh, so far, uh, I have gained practical experience working in law firms in Bulgaria, uh, in Stockholm, uh, and in Austria. Uh, I'm also a fellow of the American Bar Association Dispute Resolution Section and uh, co-founder of Young Bulgarian Arbitration Practitioners. Oh, nice. nice. Um, I wanted to ask, I'm curious, so how long have you been an F YSIC member and how did you find out about YSIC? Uh, I remember that uh, I registered myself uh, several years ago when I was uh, doing the same master's program as uh, Krina, the master's program in international commercial arbitration at Stockholm University. Mm -hmm. At that time, I learned about uh, various theater organizations um, uh, which uh, organize events and um, both webinars and on-site events and uh, also essay competitions uh, for students. Uh, and they provide a great chance to meet with uh, more established practitioners in the field. Okay, <clears throat> that's great to hear. Uh, I wanted to ask you and also um, Karina and Deborah, because we were just talking about how, you know, it was a happy accident, or how you ended up in arbitration, which is a good thing. And, and I see that you're both very successful. And maybe for our viewers here right now, maybe you can share, you know, what are the skill sets that you think that one has to have to, to be a good arbitration practitioner or an arbitrator. So and anyone can, can jump in. And answer. Um, being an arbitration practitioner uh, is a demanding task uh, which requires uh, plenty of various skills and talents. Mm -hmm. These include a pretty standard set of skills um, needed by every professional in the legal field, uh, such as uh, oral advocacy skills, written skills, uh, and um, uh, also um, good communication skills, sometimes even courage. There are, however, some hallmarks uh, which make the difference between a decent legal professional and a good arbitration practitioner. Yeah. It is of extreme importance yeah. the arbitration practitioner to possess a certain level of experience and expertise in the, co in the conduct of the arbitral proceedings. Mm -hmm. Arbitration is a specific field to meet many distinct features. Procedural rules play a key role and a skillful arbitrator will navigate through them with ease, making the entire process more efficient and understandable for the parties. It will assure that the arbitrator is capable of providing a rational and legally sound decision to settle the dispute. Mm -hmm. Also, another key uh, skill uh, is um, the knowledge and the expertise in the specific industry of the dispute. A good arbitration practitioner, practitioner will be aware of the industry concerning the dispute. 
This requires industry sector expertise as well as solid grasp of the law applicable in the field. Speciality areas of um, arbitration focus on commercial, energy, pharma disputes, as such arbitrators pertaining to niche industries uh, may benefit more from an industry, uh, arbitrations pertaining from more niche uh, industries may benefit from an industry professional. Among the key advantages of an arbitrator competent in the industry is eliminating um, the necessity for the parties to the dispute to explain basic industry issues or to retain experts. International arbitration also often involves a great number of people, the members of the arbitral tribunal, the council of the parties, the parties themselves, also experts and witnesses. What happens quite often is that all those people come from different cultural and professional backgrounds. The sole arbitrator or the members of the arbitral tribunal have the burdensome task to acknowledge all the differences and not to allow them to affect the conduct of the proceedings or the outcome of the case. This makes the ability to work well in a multinational environment a skill with a key role for a successful arbitration practitioner. I would also say that arbitration can be viewed as a project that should be delivered on time and on budget. And for this reason, good case management skills are also required. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Anything to add, um, Trina and Deborah? Um, Deborah, please. Okay, I would just say that for me, um, the skills you require to be a good arbitration practitioner are not different from those you require to be a good litigation lawyer or even a good uh, mediator, right? Or, um, we need all these, all the same skills come up in, in all these three areas. And um, basically, you know, that to, to keep going in this line, you've got to get the job, do the job, take your client's interests into account and not be overwhelmed. That's the last part. You yourself should not be overwhelmed. So you've got to bear all that in mind and keep a balance. But the exact skills, I think they do appear in all the different um forms of dispute resolution and um, it, it, so that of course with each one there could be certain things that would be slightly different that you need to focus on but the, all those skills are, are required for each area actually mm -hmm. but I think the one thing that you've got to remember for whichever area you're in is you've got to not be overwhelmed if you want to keep going well, that's a very and not, keep, keep, not keep going, I should say, keep going and not give up as many, some lawyers in Singapore have done and mm -hmm. taken up cake making, restauranteer and so on and so forth. Over to you, Adriana. Oh, although that's not bad, uh, Deborah. I mean, uh, <laughs> if you own a restaurant. <laughs> restauranteer, <laughs> acting, there are a lot of lawyers, uh, those with, who have gone into all these different areas in Singapore. This shows a, a good set of skills uh, that one has to possess uh, because uh, obviously they come hand, they become handy also in the legal profession, but you never know. Yes, but I would say uh, I would say for the for for an arbitrator, obviously uh, I agree with uh, with everything that was said. I do uh, I do believe that um, as an arbitrator, you need to be professional uh, and you need to be uh, to have a collegial behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's uh, even when you're not in a collegiate setting as an arbit with an arbitral tribunal of free, uh, um, you're still as a sole arbitrator, you're still, uh, you still have to show the skills and to use the skills to manage, as it was said, uh, cultural differences, uh, collaborate efficiently with the, with the arbitration institution, with the case managers. Uh, have a have a decent uh, um, uh, discussion with the with the with the council and so on. So I think an arbitrator has to be um, available, professional, and have a collegial behavior uh, in in the setting. Yes, I agree. I agree. So maybe just I'm very sorry to let you go, and I, I just want to maybe just a quick point from you. I want to hear from you. Um, so do you in in Bulgaria do you do you see a lot more cases as as what Deborah and Krina have been talking about how internationalization of this um, cases is, disputes are going around 
Do you see a lot more of that in where you are seated right now in Bulgaria? Just a short answer from you would be helpful. Um, no, unfortunately, uh, we don't have that many arbitration cases. Uh, the parties here still prefer litigation. And mm -hmm. what do you think um, is the real issue? Is it more mentality or is it because the court system is very efficient? I wouldn't say that uh, the court system is uh, efficient. I think that it's uh, more of mentality and other reasons. Well, uh, hopefully then in time to come, you get to do more arbitration as uh, we go along. But anyway, thanks a lot, uh, Vesla, for joining us. I was, um, it's wonderful that you have um, been part of this. So thank you very much. Thank you. So now the maybe we- I just, if I can pick up on that, I think it's sure. very interesting, the last point and your question that was asked, uh, if I may, and I think, uh, and I think Deborah uh, will agree with this, uh, uh, that perhaps, uh, uh, and related to the discussion with the seat, uh, why some uh, places are not that attractive. Uh, um, I think it depends on what the, what the state put, puts forward, I would say. Uh, if you look at Singapore and what it was built to have the, 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 the perfect setting for arbitration, as I said before, involving the courts, uh, involving the arbitration institution, uh, mediation institutions as well, the laws that are put in place. I think you have that, you need to have that perfect storm to convince somebody to stay there. And, and there are some jurisdictions and with my, my, as I said, my time spent in Brazil and also coming from Eastern Europe, uh, I have to say that you need a lot of effort in that direction. And some jurisdictions may be more successful than others because they have state support. So even if we say we want to delocalize arbitration and we want to place arbitration somewhere hanging, uh, we have to admit the reality that arbitration to be successful needs the support of the, yeah. of the state. I guess that because of the legal framework that comes along. And I think, for example, that a lot of the leading arbitration hubs today, and they, they had to, you know, there had to be a revamp of their legislation. They had to keep up with the times. And sometimes that's always hard, right? You're always having to keep up to the right the top. And I, I'm sure that is how it is. And, and also, you mustn't, Singapore success as an arbitration center didn't happen overnight. It was like 30 years of slowly building up. Yeah. And, and of course, the fact that the authorities, the state, the courts mm -hmm. wanted Singapore to succeed as an arbitration center and yeah. made a determined effort to make sure that the rules, the laws um, support it. This was very important, actually. Yeah. So maybe just since uh, you're on this topic of like building things up, but what do you think, um, you know, I mean, all practitioners, young practitioners, when you want to build a profile in arbitration, so do you have some tips, like some, like couple of tips that we can ask both of you? Well, um, I don't think there's any special secret. Um, obviously the way to build up a good profile is to do a lot of cases and get known for doing a lot of cases, but that is easier said than done. How do you break in? It's a very difficult thing. So for the young practitioner, it's probably best that they do, as Alexander did, do a lot of causes, maybe attend conferences, um, try to attend international or regional conferences so that they can perhaps build a larger profile and, and even maybe write articles. Okay, they may have no experience. <laughs> they may be a first year lawyer, but you can still write a good article. And if you, if you make a concerted effort this way with the aim of getting the cases and doing the cases, uh, I think you might, you'll get somewhere, but it isn't an overnight thing also. <laughs> yeah. Karina? I, yeah. I agree. I, I agree. And, and of course, with uh, uh, also you're wearing my hat of, uh, of, uh, of guiding students every year in the field and specializing in the field of arbitration. We see many students uh, coming uh, um, uh, at Stockholm with uh, with certain background in uh, in uh, dispute resolution. Uh, we do have students uh, uh, with experience in arbitration specifically, but I think what's the most important is that they come and understand that this is a process that you have to lay lay down the foundation of a successful career, and that starts with a solid basis of. Uh, understanding arbitration and, uh, and, and not limited to arbitration, understanding dispute resolution, as Deborah mentioned earlier, and how they interact uh, with each other. It is also important that they have 
uh, uh, knowledge in the in the substance in the in the substantive law. I think that's important for any arbitration practitioner. Go and spend some time working on M and A, working on on construction contracts, uh, and so on and so forth, because you get a better understanding of 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 how disputes uh, work in the setting of arbitration in general. And I think what's what's also important. Uh, because you have to break in and you need a, you need luck. Yeah, that's that's also we have to put it out there. Um, you need to work hard and you need to connect to your peers. Uh, and I think it's the most important because I see students, uh, it's great to connect to uh, experienced practitioners, um, but we all know that they're, they're very busy, although they're all available to the, the young generation, uh, at least uh, 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 most of us are. Uh, but they have to connect to their to their fellow colleagues because they will grow together, and this is how uh, uh, the net increases. Yeah, so don't, so don't go to the top. Don't go to the top. Uh, 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 the mentorship programs, young arbitration uh, practitioner association. These are this is what they make them, will make them grow in the future together. Ping, I have a question here from the audience, and the question is, what is your advice to students, especially at the time of COVID? So how do, you know, how do they develop their profile? We, um, I mean, as you know, as we, uh, in, the, in the legal profession in general in arbitration, uh, well, students in teaching had to go online, and that was challenging because at least at master level, um, students take one year of their life to experience, to, to get an experience. And that's the experience of a master specialized program. Mm -hmm. and, and half of that is the learning process, the teaching that is in the classroom with the, with the teachers, with the, with the guest lectures and so on. But the other half is, is what happens outside the classroom. And, uh, and the diversity of, of, of the students that we have in the classroom and being a new setting, uh, knowing a new culture, all this developing excellent skills that were put forth for any successful arbitration practitioner. Uh, so my, uh, of course, it was a challenge for us to, de to, to develop the program or to reassess, uh, reposition the programs in a way that would respond in the online setting. And that means to make sure that the students are engaged all the time. But the students now have access to uh, infinite resources. Uh, for example, this webinar, uh, we have uh, guest lectures that no, normally they would not be present in the programs. Uh, the, 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 most of the resources have moved online. For instance, publishers, they added more resources and they open up access to resources, as Alexander said, where take a course and, and so on. So I think the, the, the human element is missing, but the opportunities are not missing. There are, inter, there, there are online internships with law firms. Uh, uh, law firms, they're still offering internships. There are still jobs. And I think this resolution, Deborah, if, if you want to add to that, I think uh, there's still, and there will be an increase in offer for, for dispute resolution lawyers. Yes, I agree. There's um, dispute resolution lawyers are still, still needed, still on demand. And really um, what this COVID-19 period has done is actually open up the resources because you know, before we'd go to a conference or even a seminar and you'd be 30 or 50 or 100 people there. And now it could be a few hundred who yeah. are all listening in. So there's, there are many more opportunities. But I suppose you'll have, the students have to uh, choose correctly and, and get, you know, get the, get, attend the right webinars and so on to give them the right uh, background and, and build up. Yes. So I'll take that cue to invite another guest who has joined us in, in taking, you know, like the COVID situation, maximizing it by attending webinars. Can I now invite one person from the Philippines, um, Robert? Hi. Uh, good day, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi, Robert. Robert, tell us a bit about yourself and, you know, what do you do? Yeah, hi. So I am calling from the Philippines. I'm currently... Head of Privacy Policy and Risk Management at the Manila Electric Company. So part of my risk ma management responsibilities would include 
basically choosing whether or not to litigate or arbitrate or whether or not to include an arbitration clause. In terms of past life, I was um, a dispute resolution uh, lawyer in Singapore uh, for a couple of years. So I am quite familiar with the SIAC and its rules. Yeah. Robert, so you, you mentioned that you, you're considering whether arbitration or litigation, right, in your role as a data privacy head. Uh, mm -hmm. So what, what kinds of contracts where you sort of like, do you decide for a certain contracts it should be arbitration or litigation? And what are the factors in your decision? Okay, so it's a wide array. Um, it could include tech, um, power generation related, electricity distribution and transportation. Of course, if we, we do have our risk management and we do try to compute in terms of the possible damages and possible claims. And if we consider that if, if it's a low value, a potentially low value claim, then we might opt for um, litigation. However, a key component, and as I mentioned before, I was in um, data privacy, a key component would be the risk assessment, especially when it comes to fines. Now, even if the, the claim could be a low value claim, but if we are facing substantial fines and if it's a matter that requires um, fast action from our side, then we do consider arbitration. So for example, there are certain instances that we need to do remediation measures. Uh, we need to notify government within 72 hours. And now it's kind of difficult if you have an uncooperative counterparty. So yeah. if, we if we go for lit court litigation, for example, then, well, firstly, because of COVID, then um, the capacity of the courts would be a consideration. Whereas I do remember, because with SIAC, you do have, it, well, SIAC has this um, emergency arbitration. Yeah. I do remember, it could be like, I do remember one council mentioning that even during holidays, it's possible for SIAC to appoint a council or sorry, to appoint an emergency arbitrator. And for us, especially in tech and in data privacy, these are critical factors that yeah. we consider on whether or not we should put in an arbitration clause. So uh, I'm Robert, if you. I could just jump in there. Um, sure. In your line, confidentiality must be very important. So would mm -hmm. an arbitration and mediation actually outweigh litigation for you? Oh, yes, definitely. Because um, especially when it comes to data privacy and even just processing personal information, then we need to make sure that none of those would come out. And once we go through the court litigation process, then everything will be public. So yeah. that's why, indeed, it, it is a major consideration for us. Yeah. So I was just saying, Robert, so um, are we counting on you to put in SIC clauses? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you see, uh, as I mentioned in my past life, I was in Singapore, a dispute resolution lawyer in Singapore. So that's why I am familiar with the process already. And it's just this idea of I know being in the same time zone and also just this thought of, I'm sorry to, to say for the SIAC Council, the thought for us, the thought of having an emergency arbitrator in a few hours, that to us is very important. So yes. Yes. I mean, in my past life as a counsel, there were many holidays lost on, on <laughs> the arbitrator. Um, Robert, you mentioned also that you, you were uh, in private practice. So how was the transition like from private practice to in-house? Um, well, <laughs> so now as a client, <laughs> uh, we do get, uh, at least in that respect, we do get, you know, um, opinions and we do ask our counsel on you know still so even with my experience in dispute resolution um, we still want to have counsel's opinion especially if it's a contract in the Philippines then we st still do need to listen to um, um, local counsel but that in terms of transition though it's been good because I I've sort of become an agent for arbitration especially since this is a traditional um, company, it's been in existence for 120 years. So for them, arbitration, it's going to be like, why would we choose that? Why Singapore and all these things? So yeah. that opportunity to, 
to propose and even to choose because most of the time I get to decide whether or not we will have an arbitration clause. So that to me was a pretty nice. Did it fun to instruct lawyers? <laughs> exactly. So Robert, you're a powerful man. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not yet. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I wanted to ask Robert or Krina and Deborah, what, what do you think does the immediate and long term future of ADR looks like in, in light of COVID 19? Just shifting from, you know, from the present day. So, how? I, I, I would venture to pick up on what Robert mentioned, which I think it's important that uh, you have, uh, um, and I think the Chief Justice of Singapore mentioned this uh, in, in the past years, which is ADR stands for appropriate dispute resolution, uh, meaning that you have to be mindful to the fact that uh, it, you don't go to a certain dispute resolution mechanism because it's an alternative to something or because something is uh, uh, so terrible that you want to escape that. You go to a certain dispute, and, and Deborah also mentioned, alluded to this, you, you, you select the dispute resolution mechanism uh, for the reasons presented by Robert, you have to make an assessment. It might be that mediation is the best option for that specific dispute. And you can see this not only in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in how companies, so users are, 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 are making the most of this and assessing and having policies, uh, perhaps a, a, a multi-tiered uh, or progression in selecting the dispute resolution mechanism, but you also see this with the law firms uh, and in particular mediation, uh, uh, the major law firms, uh, uh, Magic uh, Circle uh, in London uh, in, in maybe 15 years ago, uh, there was no mediation specialist. Uh, um, so, so now they have a diversified portfolio attending the needs of the clients. So I would, I would say that the future of, of ADR is appropriate dispute resolution and also uh, dispute prevention. I think that that's probably, and in the context related to the pandemics and as, as mentioned by Robert as well, it's important to have to prevent the disputes and that engages lawyers and institutions and all stakeholders equally. So uh, we, we, it's a win-win. Yes. It's true yeah. because I think um, at the start of this year, everyone was very hesitant about virtual hearings, but it seems like now everyone yeah. um, has gone through a very long experience doing that. Yeah. Yes. And, and in Singapore, um, in fact, the courts, yeah, we're having Zoom hearings all the time, not just for the interlocutories, but my, I have my, um, well, okay, one of my partners is in court and although... Um, for him, it is actually in court, but they had witnesses on Zoom. So this, this new reality actually seems to have stepped forward, like um, you could have a total hearing on, on Zoom. But um, of course, um, not the criminal matters, although regrettably we had somebody sentenced to death on Zoom. Um, <laughs> but for, mainly it is the civil and civil disputes that are all moving towards having more and more Zoom hearings. So in a sense, I think it's, it, it's the same for arbitration and litigation. Mm -hmm. the, the, the one area where I think it would be difficult to have Zoom, where I think it, lack of human contact has an impact is mediation. Because I've always felt that mediation works when you get all those people sitting in the same room yeah. and looking at each other and, and explaining their, their feelings and yeah. then trying to bring them together. I've not done a mediation on Zoom yet. I'm, I'm doubtful. I mean, I know it could probably work, but I think it won't work so well. That, that, that's my feeling. Deborah, I mean, you don't have the, uh, uh, the opportunity to lock everyone up and only letting them out after, <laughs> after they come to <laughs> agreement, right? <laughs> that, that's yes, not that's possible. Right. <laughs> and so maybe for me, I'll pick up on that on the virtual hearings. At least, and I do remember this because, you know, after Circuit Breaker, we started having Zoom hearings and then the interlocutories. And then I suppose for us, well, in my past life, it was good because we were in Singapore and the infrastructure was there. And then coming back to the Philippines, and then I realized infrastructure is limited. And so now we had to decide, okay, nothing is moving. And I guess in terms of business continuity, we're also thinking, okay, maybe there should be some dispute resolution continuity. And the thing is, 
uh, we were having or oh, facing challenges with the you know um, normal court litigation, not having um, rules and virtual hearing. And so for us, we thought, okay, at least with arbitration, parties can consent to having virtual hearings. And then, and also again, with, at least for tech industry and data privacy in particular, and as mentioned by Trina, it may depend on the particular dispute for us. And this is something we have been thinking about. Um, because of the 72 hour remediation notification for us, we just don't have the time to mediate or to negotiate. So at least even we had to make sure that, okay, um, maybe it's not good for this particular contract to have a multi-tiered um, dispute resolution clause because just simply we can't make it to the 72 hour deadline. So I completely agree with Prina that it really depends on the situation. It needs to be appropriate dispute resolution. Well, that has been very well said. Well, thank you so much, Robert. We really appreciate you. You joining us today. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. So I think we have another, we, we, we still have time to uh, take another uh, volunteer from the audience. Let's call on Peter from Nigeria. They're going around the globe in a very short time. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I think you're on mute, Peter. Hello. Hi, Peter. So tell us about yourself. Yes. As you know, my name is Peter. Uh, I practice law in Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, I work in a law firm, Directive for LP. It's a full service law firm uh, where we basically handle this post resolution. Mm -hmm. So I'm practicing law for four years now. I have been called to bar to Nigerian bar in uh, November of 2016. So that's. Uh... So um, I'm 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 also curious to know how how long have you been a YSIC member and how did you find out about YSIC? Okay, I uh, I've been a member of you know, uh, y, YCAC since uh, July this year. Okay. Yes, I found out uh, about the YCAC uh, via a webinar. I joined uh, one of the SIAC webinars. So that's where I, uh, after the webinar, one of the panelists hinted on uh, that young arbitrators should uh, try to join the YCAC. So after the webinar, I uh, went online and uh, applied to join. So graciously, my application was granted and I became a member, which I'm grateful for. That's good. We're, we're happy to have you. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah, so Peter, I mean, we we're just talking with Robert about like, and, and Deborah and Krina about the, how, how COVID has obviously made it virtual and things like that. So do you think, just, uh, just looking the the future, do you think these are permanent changes to, to arbitration or even just beyond that mediation, litigation, whatever, from, from a viewpoint in, in Nigeria? Definitely. I think uh, it's, it has changed everything going forward because uh, coming from a jurisdiction where the justice system is not so efficient, you see that people have realized that arbitration and other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms is the way out. You understand? So, and with the uh, happening of COVID-19, things have changed. People are now going to going more into arbitration, mediation, and a lot of that dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, then, uh, talking about the uh, remote hearings, you know, even the courts, our courts have adopted, uh, you know, remote hearings, and uh, even arbitration, I, I've, I've, been, uh, able, I've been privileged to be in uh, two uh, arbitration. One is international, one is local, where we used uh, remote hearings for the, for the both arbitration. So I, I think, yes, that COVID-19 has changed the way disputes are resolved. Mm -hmm. right. I, I'm curious, how's the arbitration scene in, in Nigeria? Yes, arbitration is, um, I, I can say it's popular in Nigeria hmm. in the sense that, like I said before, 
court cases in Nigeria take time. So people have realized that, see, we need to adopt a means to resolve our disputes that will take maximum of one year. You know, but if you go through the courts, you might uh, see your cases lasting for 10 years, five years. That is if you go on appeal from court of appeal to the Supreme Court. So, but arbitration takes shorter time, though it is more costly, but it takes shorter time. And you see that all these multinationals in Nigeria, all these businesses that, that value their time, they adopt arbitration so that they will quickly resolve their disputes and move ahead. So I, I think arbitration in Nigeria is, uh, has boon and is still uh, developing and mm -hmm. is advancing. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, what rules um, are commonly adopted though for arbitrations in Nigeria? Is there any preference? Yes, there's a preference. Usually they prefer ICC rules. Yeah, oh. you know, yeah, they prefer ICC rules. Like, the international arbitration I mentioned earlier is uh, conducted under the auspices of uh, ICC uh, mm -hmm. due to the fact that uh, they, are, is, um, is, uh, they also like uh, prefer the charter list of arbitrators, you know, due to the fact that they are European and you know Nigeria and Europe they have um, have been colonized by Britain and all. So, uh, but I must say that having gone through the Syriac rules. I, uh, I have seen that the clause, the SIAC clause, is, uh, is also something that we can go for. And having uh, started participating in SIAC webinars and uh, being a member of YSIAC, I think I will push for the popularity of uh, SIAC. That's good yes. to hear. Uh, yes. Peter, before I let you go, just from going back to the seat, do you see a lot of uh, seat being London? I assume that you do uh, most of the arbitration are seated in London. Is that what your experience is? Yes, that's what the experience is. The, the, even the arbitration I cited earlier, well, the seat was London. Right. It was London. Though, because of COVID-19, we weren't able to travel all the way. So we had to uh, adopt remote here. So, but usually, all, almost all the arbitration hearings I've had of, even you know the popular P and ID, and the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The city was London, so mostly it's London. Mostly and London. Um, Peter, not the Hague or Paris. No, not the Hague or Paris. Mostly London. Right. London. Yeah, they, you know, Nigerians they prefer London. I don't know why, but maybe because of the colonial uh, experience, they just prefer London. Okay, um, so maybe thank you very much, Peter, um, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Like I said, it's, um, it's great to have you on board from Nigeria, and uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Thank you for having me. Okay, I think we've, um, uh, actually we do have uh, maybe about um, five more minutes, actually. And so I'm just going to, we're just going to ask one more question to all of us, and then before we close, um, Adriana, do you want to jump in? Well, yeah, there's, a, there's one question here from the audience, and the question is, how effective is webinar for developing online experience for budding arbitrators? So maybe we can hear from Deborah and Karina. So webinars like, like this, I suppose, yeah. What the question is, uh, if it develops skills or uh, if it's useful for um, visibility uh, in building a future career? But I'll, I'll try to answer both. Uh, I, I think it, it develops skills uh, both for the speakers and also for, the, for those in the audience because obviously in the context of uh, virtual hearings uh, that we predict will, will have quite a lot, at least procedural hearings, I'm sure that this will be the norm in the future. Uh, but it's, uh, it's obviously it's difficult to sit before a computer screen and, and, and try to focus um, and, and, and try to, as in, as in this case, ask questions in the, in, the, in the question function, but at the same time pay attention to, to the speaker. Uh, so I think the set of skills, um, it's useful. Uh, it develops uh, uh, for the future. 
As for the visibility, I think uh, the format of, of today's webinar is, is excellent because it gives the floor to, to the members of the audience. Uh, but I also think that there is good visibility for those in the audience as well by asking questions uh, and, uh, and taking this forward. Uh, for instance, uh, something that I, I, I forgot to mention, but uh, with, with the disclaimer that uh, Benson also is involved in this Kluver arbitration blog, uh, all these resources online uh, where the participants, they can uh, um, uh, expose their views on certain topics. They can benefit from the discussion, uh, obviously, <laughs> whether Chatham rules or, or otherwise, and, uh, and write about the topic, write about the debate. Um, and uh, with, the, with the multitude of uh, uh, resources online, they can have a voice. Uh, and I think that's, that's important. So I think in both development, development skills and visibility, it might be that one, one gets more visibility in an online setting, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Deborah? No, I, I agree with what Krina says. I mean, obviously it's like webinars is not sufficient to turn you into an arbitration practitioner, but for someone who's starting out, it's a good way to both get visibility and to practice their skills, actually, since um, there could be many um, arbitral hearings going forth, which are either wholly or partly, partly um, on the on screen. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I mean, this is really on this talk about um, advocacy on screen. And before we close this whole session, um, so I just thought that maybe if both of you could share some tips about how or virtual hearing advocacy. So for example, like speaking slower because there's a time lag on the technology. So Deborah, do you want to start? Just some tips. Well, um, actually, I don't, you know, we've had a lot of, we've been developing in Singapore a lot of written advocacy. So even in the courts, there's written advocacy and then you speak. Um, and, and so I don't think it is very different, the fact that it's on the screen. But there is one thing that I experienced in my recent Zoom hearing, that they kept not being able to hear me. So it's the technology. And I had to pick up on that. I kept forgetting that there was some issue. And people, they would say, oh, I, we didn't hear you. So that's actually quite important. You don't want to have put forward brilliant arguments, which nobody heard. Hmm. But in essence, I don't think the skills are very different. I, uh, I agree with uh, Deborah, but I think it's, um, I mean, if you look at March, April, um, or even before February, when, when we had to move um, so quickly, and uh, I, we have to praise everybody for the amazing work. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, in my case, I, I finalized a, 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 hear a one week hearing one day before uh, the lockdown. Um, and I just going back, I realized, uh, uh, wow, that was, I don't even remember how that is to have a one week of hearings. But then uh, we continued having uh, other procedural hearings or hearings on the merits. And we had to develop fast the skills. So I think one thing is that at this point, uh, uh, where we are, we are more familiar with the setting. Uh, and we could train ourselves and change our habits uh, 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 in accordance to the new, set new setting. And I think one, I, one piece of advice that I would have is to make sure that in this virtual setting, uh, the, the vocabulary is a bit, uh, it's slightly adapted. I think you need more clear sentences, more shorter sentences, uh, clear ideas put forward, and for two reasons. One, uh, uh, as practitioners, you don't have access to your team. They, they are not next to you to pass the, that post-it that you see right away. Um, of course, you have the collaboration on other means uh, um, that the arbitrators might not see. Uh, but also arbitrators, you must not, we must not forget that arbitrators are not in the same room anymore. Uh, and they cannot consult with each other and they cannot probably make the decisions on spot. So I think from, from, from the advocate side, I think it has to be a bit of, uh, a, a bit of change to adapt to um, how, how, uh, how, how the case is presented. I would just add that I argued an appeal on Zoom, on Zoom yeah, was it whatever, yeah, Zoom. 
And the main drawback I found was not in getting the ideas across to the court. The main drawback was that I couldn't have people passing me notes and consulting with one. And actually, they were in the same room. But because of this idea that there has to be social distancing, they were all seated one meter away from me. So I found that to be a drawback. But obviously, it can be overcome. You have to think of a way of overcoming it. And I have, as I said, one of my uh, partners was recently doing a trial where he was cross-examining on Zoom, and he found that it was not so effective. But years ago, I did one on video link, and I actually found it to be quite effective. It's like you and the witness are having this, you'll be having this one-on-one -on -one conversation almost. So I, I suppose it depends on the circumstances and maybe adapting your style a bit, you know, but obviously cross-examination on Zoom is maybe I'd say the jury is out on how effective that is. And that's the exciting thing. I mean, that's not, nothing that is actually fixed and you know, our practices as arbitration practitioners always keep changing. And um, on that note, I think on behalf of um, Adriana, we run out of time. So on behalf of Adriana, uh, we want like to thank you, Deborah and Krina for joining us today on uh, this talk. We also would like to thank all our pa third panelists in this fishbowl discussion. I hope that was a bit more dynamic. Um, you felt that at least the more questions. And lastly, obviously, a big thanks to the, uh, the BED team behind SIC team who's um, running this, as well as the audience for all the questions you have sent along and for participating. So Adria, on behalf of um, the YSIC community, we will look forward to seeing you in the next YSIC webinar. Well, take care until then. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.